Dr. David Ford is professor of church history at St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, Master of Divinity from Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, and his PhD is from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. Welcome, Dr. Ford. Thank you, John. Good to be with you. So you've lectured on the historical factors surrounding the events following the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451, where the Church divided over language that declared that Christ had two natures in one person. Uh, there were reconcilia uh, reconciliation efforts, apparently, to bring the sides back together right after that. Uh, but they failed, unfortunately, all the way up through the Ecumenical Council in Constantinople in 681. So, we'd love to hear your insight on what were the efforts and why did they fail at that point? Well, uh, <clears throat> I uh, will try to uh, share uh, with everyone what I basically uh, cover in my class. Uh, so I'll be uh, consulting my book of handouts, as I call it. Uh, and uh, this is under the heading, the Orthodox Oriental, Orthodox Dialogue, some considerations. And I start this handout with a list of 10 factors which contributed to the failure of the reconciliation efforts between the Fourth Ecumenical Council, uh, Chalcedon 451, and the Sixth Ecumenical Council in Constantinople uh, in 681. Yeah, and, this will, uh, this just will to, be helpful. Uh, and so you've identified 10 of them. And, yes. And uh, maybe we just kind of go through them uh, together. As I'm looking at it, the first one you actually lay at the feet of the Church of Rome. Please explain why. Yes. Uh, I'm calling this stubborn, fundamentalistic, literalistic interpretation of the doctrinal decree of the Council of Chalcedon on the part of the Church of Rome. Now, uh, Rome feels uh, very committed to the exact wording of Chalcedon. I think one big reason, huge reason, is that their bishop at the time, Leo, St. Leo of Rome, uh, his tome, his famous tome, was read at the Council of Chalcedon, and the bishop spontaneously spontaneously cried, Peter has spoken through Leo. So uh, they're committed to the exact language of uh, the, the Tome of Leo and the definition of Chalcedon, which incorporates some of the language from the Tome, uh, not all of it. Um, and we see this refusal to go beyond the uh, exact letter of Chalcedon in the year 520, when Pope Hormizdas, he's approached by some of the non-Chalcedonians who are very eager for reconciliation, and they're hoping that he will affirm the statement, one of the Holy Trinity suffered, uh, which of course is uh, <laughs> very uh, standard in, in our usage in the Orthodox faith. And uh, Rome eventually comes to accept this, but at that moment, the Pope refused to say one of the Holy Trinity suffered. And so you have the automatic question, well then, who suffered? And uh, they uh, were tending to say, well, only the humanity suffered. Hmm. But then how can a, how can you, how can humanity, uh, it doesn't exist on its own. Uh, every, uh, every instance of human nature occurs when it's connected, right, with a uh, hypostasis, uh, our, our personhood. So uh, it uh, was a, uh, a real setback to the uh, reconciliation efforts. And then I see on the second one, it's kind of another fundamentalist approach, only this time on behalf of the non-Chalcedonian churches involving uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria? Yes. And uh, this parallel uh, approach here, I, I gained from Father John Meyendorf of Blessed Memory. He specifies this very clearly in his book, uh, 
Imperial Unity and Christian Division, it seems that there is a comparable, stubborn, fundamentalistic, literalistic interpretation on the part of the non-Chalcedonians by uh, of the words Saint Cyril, Saint Cyril of Alexandria did use sometimes one nature of the Word of God incarnate. But it's so interesting, um, and 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 of course our understanding is, and we are convinced Cyril's understanding is when he says one nature of the Word of God incarnate, he really is indicating one hypostasis, one person of the Word of God. There's the divinity incarnate. There's the humanity. He's really saying one uh, hypothesis in 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 with uh, or or with two natures. Uh, but um, they cling to this phrase that is misleading because it seems to indicate, well, maybe there is some kind of confusion of uh, the two natures because they're not exactly saying one hypothesis in two natures, which for us, the Orthodox uh, makes it much more clear. Um, yeah. Yeah, and these are factors that were back then. We're going to talk about, well, what about now in, in a bit. But let's yeah. continue looking at, well, what were the reconciliation efforts? They did fail. Why did they fail? And you've identified 10 of them. And apparently the third one involves violence? Oh, my. There was, yes, it's really a, a, a very troubling part of the story. Uh, after Chalcedon, uh, there was a new uh, Archbishop of Alexandria appointed because Cyril, the Archbishop, uh, was... Uh, refused to join in the condemnation of Eutyches, uh, which really does say that that's the real monophysism, monophysitism that really says the humanity of Christ is absorbed, uh, subsumed by his divinity, leaving uh, just one nature. And uh, Cyril refused to uh, uh, join in that condemnation of Eutyches. Um, so we need, uh, they, they needed to uh, appoint a new archbishop, and they sent uh, Pro Proterius. Uh, and he was, um, six years later, uh, there, there was resentment that he was imposed. Uh, of course, Dioscorus was a favorite son of the Alexandrians. Uh, and uh, he was actually murdered. And then there was a riot uh, in, in 457. Many were killed. The imperial troops were suppressing the riot. And that's just one of uh, a number of kind of comparable incidents uh, involving, fr from the Miaphysite, the non chalcedonian point of view, involving imperial uh, pressure uh, and, and uh, too much involvement in their church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's... But apparently there over. was also some uh, brutality occurring on the part of the Byzantines, which uh, is in your fourth factor. Explain that. Yes, yes. So yes, just to emphasize, there's violence on, on both sides. Uh, th there's a lot to uh, uh, repent of, honestly, uh, uh, on both sides. So let's look at number five. Uh, you mentioned the emperor and the empress. What role did they play in leading to the failure of reconciliation back then? Well, it's very interesting. Saints Justinian and Theodora, they're two of my uh, favorite uh, married saints. They were a great team. And uh, Emperor Justinian entrusted to his wife Theodora, the empress, the task of winning, of helping to work to win back uh, the non-Chalcedonians, and uh, so she gives special uh, care to Bishop Theodosius, allowing him to stay in an imperial palace. He's he's indicating uh, willingness to work for reconciliation, uh, and so he is uh, allowed to consecrate uh, non-Chalcedonian bishops for the Ghassanid Arabs, who were kind of a buffer uh, group between the uh, uh, the Byzantines and, and the Arabs uh, in the middle of the uh, 6th century. This is sometime before uh, Muhammad. 
Uh, and some people say, oh, Theodora must have been uh, kind of a secret uh, uh, non-Cassadonian uh, because she gave so much support to the um, uh, to this particular bishop. But it's all in the hope, you see, of the, the, uh, the uh, they were all so much hoping that reconciliation was uh, going to occur in the near future. And if it did, you know, then it really wouldn't matter yeah. who uh, ordained whom. Hmm. So it, it's in that spirit. So then I yes. guess it was inevitable sooner or later an alternate hierarchy was established by the non-Chalcedonian group? Yes, it's it's interesting that doesn't really occur, at least in the uh, uh, in the area of Syria, it doesn't really occur until the 530s, so it's about 80 years after Chalcedon, uh, with so much resentment of the Byzantine overlordship, uh, these uh, uh, moments of, of violence and so on. Uh, there isn't we there really there is there is I think quite a bit of nationalism involved. Uh, of course, uh, in these southern regions, uh, the people are are Semites. They're not Greeks, um, and that all plays into them finally uh, establishing an alternate hierarchy. It had to be done secretly because the Byzantine authorities would have suppressed such efforts. And so there is this man named Jacob Bar Adai. Uh, of Edessa, who traveled extensively incognito, secretly ordaining uh, priests who would be staunchly anti-Chalcedonian. And it's when the schism really, really takes root. Up, it's, it's really interesting up until mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah, still see. basically the one church, at least in those Syria reasons. It's a little more unclear in Alexandria when the alternate hierarchy really took shape. Well, and then uh, you identify some uh, splinter groups among the non-Chalcedonian faction. Tell us about that, and how did that impact the failure of uh, reu reunification? Yes, well, again, uh, hearkening to Father John Meindorf, he uh, writes that there were something like 20 different groups of non-Chalcedonians which made it uh, all the more difficult to uh, have further discussions. You know, who who is who is really uh, the leading group that could then speak for the others? But this is one of the great hopeful signs of uh, uh, current dialogue. We don't have such uh, we we don't have different groups among the uh, Oriental churches at this point. We just have the basic five. So that's. That's a helpful development. So, uh, in your identification of the ninth factor, you've mentioned this uh, already, but nationalism. Uh, maybe unpack that a little bit more. What role did nationalism play in the failure of reconciliation? Yes, um, as I was as I was saying, uh, it's kind of natural for each. Uh, ethnic group to have their own <laughs> church. Um, another reason for the uh, for the uh, their resentment of the Byz of the Byzantines was the fact of the Persian invasions that swept through uh, now this is a little later, 590s into the 600s, which reinforces, I think, this uh, antagonism against the Byzantines. There was resentment that the Byzantine uh, army was not able, first of all, to prevent the Persian invasion, and then uh, as uh, they are finally driven out under Heraclius, about 10 years of warfare in the 620s, um, then the whole area is so weakened that this is right at the moment that Islam erupts out of uh, Arabia and makes it so much easier then for the Arabs to conquer all these southern areas, Syria, Palestine yeah. and uh, Alexandria. Yeah. So it reinforces the resentment. Which is your ninth factor, that uh, political conquest by the uh, the Ottomans, I assume, and uh, that's just... This was not the Ottomans. It no, was not, was, I beg your sorry. pardon. No, sorry, John. Yeah, the, the, the Arabs, yeah. Okay. The Ottomans don't come along until uh, their invasion of, of uh, Asia Minor uh, in the 1200s. 
That's yeah, sorry, helpful. in the ten hundreds. In the ten hundreds. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, thank you for that clarification. That's, that's very helpful. So, finally, uh, a theological attempt to win back the non-Chalcedonians backfired, apparently, and actually led to heresy, which had to be addressed then in the Sixth Council. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, it's an indication, John, of the tremendous efforts extending <laughs> after Chalcedon really 230 years, all the way until the Sixth Council, uh, to win back those who had rejected Chalcedon. Uh, the pastoral heart there, I think, is is very clear uh, in the in the midst of you know the pressurizing that that, that what that did backfire. Now, in this case, or in the uh, the year after, uh, the years after 610, the uh, idea of uh, what came to be known as monoenergism. Uh, came through uh, say, uh, a patriarch Sergius of Constantinople and uh, the Emperor Heraclius. They, they, they uh, worked together on this formula that said there is one divine human energy in Christ. Uh, and this would be reflecting his, his uh, personhood uh, as he is uh, uh, Directing, let's say, the uh, the divine nature and the and the human nature that he has. Uh, so it's uh, it's so tantalizing. This formula is not only appealing to the uh, non Chalcedonians, uh, the Miaphysites, but also the Nestorians. Uh, they uh, were drawn to this this formula, and uh, it was so difficult to see how it's erroneous. Uh, it's not until about 20 years later that St. Sophronius of uh, Jerusalem sees problems with it. And then his disciple, of course, the great St. Maximus the Confessor, he delves deeply into the, uh, the theology involved here and, and concludes that if there's only the one energy, uh, and this gets transmuted, by the way, into monothelitism, one will, and it's actually the Bishop of Rome who makes that uh, development, Pope Honorius. Uh, if there is no, uh, we, we like to call it a willpower that's embedded mm. both in the human nature and in the divine nature, uh, then something is lacking in Christ's humanity. Mm. Uh, willpower, you see, is something we all share as humans, right? Uh, and, uh, of course, as Gregory the Theologian says, what has not been assumed has not been saved. So Christ has this uh, uh, natural force embedded in, uh, in his humanity. Uh, and, of course, then we must have it also. It's something we all share. We, uh, Father St. Maximus, in, uh, goes further and... Uh, talks about the gnomic will, which is embedded in our personhood, in our uh, hypostasis, whereby we uh, can choose whether to cooperate with the natural uh, human will. We all have this 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 willpower that's always pointed in the right direction. It's always pointed towards the Lord. Uh, so uh, I like to. Uh, Say with my students, all we have to do is is uh, go with the flow, you know, get on board with our natural human will, uh, always deciding to uh, cooperate with that will that's always pointed towards Christ, and we'll be fine. That's the that's the uh, the Christian life. Uh, so, but this uh, this error that turns into monothelitism um, gets supported by the emperors. This is. Uh, uh, it's 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 another one of the unfortunate kind of developments that can happen when there's such a close alliance of church yeah. and state uh, for various reasons. Uh, uh, two uh, emperors actually uh, enforce this as the law of the land, and uh, that's the case then for about forty years. And we have to thank uh, Pope Agatho of Rome actually organizing conferences. Uh, that lead up to the Sixth Council in uh, 
680 and 681 in, in Constantinople. And we see that, John, as a, an ex extension of, of Chalcedon, the affirming of uh, the two natures uh, in Christ. Now we have just kind of a further refinement that embedded in each of those natures is a natural will. Hmm. And so, yeah. yeah. Was so, this please. what eventually caused St. Maximus the Confessor to get his tongue cut out? Yes, because this was in opposition yeah. to uh, uh, this law of the land that the emperors were enforcing. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the church was more or less forced to, to go along with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I feel like I've been in a history class at St. Egon's. Thank you, <laughs> oh, Dr. Great. Ford. That, that was really, great, really great. helpful. And yeah, so here we are today. Uh, you know, we've just heard these 10 factors, uh, which kind of uh, delayed any possibility and then made it impossible for reconciliation at that time to take place. But are those factors still in play today? Is there any reason for hope that, well, that was then, this is now? Yes, there's lots of hope. Uh, Rome no longer opposes uh, the Theopostite formula that we were talking about, one of the Holy Trinity suffered. The Byzantine Empire has long disappeared. Uh, uh, as we mentioned, there's no longer significant differences among the Oriental uh, Orthodox bodies. Um, Egypt, Syria, and Armenia, uh, to include Armenia, to include Ethiopia, they have uh, political uh, freedom now. They're not under the Byzantines. Uh, there is still, of course, Islam as a major force uh, in, uh, in those lands, Egypt, Palestine, and, and Syria. But the churches there are free to engage in international dialogue. And so the Arab conquest really is not... Uh, a factor any longer. You know, it really was a factor at the time of the Sixth Council. Mm -hmm. the, the Islamic uh, uh, conquests had occurred about 50 years earlier, cutting off those areas where the non-Chalcedonians were living, which made further dialogue really logistically impossible uh, back then. So now it's, it's far, far different. Yes, mm -hmm. many, many reasons for, for optimism here. Yes. So there have been efforts now in recent decades, uh, going back to the 60s, I understand, to have yeah. dialogue between various Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox uh, groups, patriarchs, representatives, uh, bishops. And so uh, enlighten us on uh, maybe the more recent ones. Do you feel those have been more productive, uh, like in the 60s? And we're going to actually look specifically at what's called the Second Agreement. But uh, yeah. first of all, give us yeah. that overview of these dialogues. Yes, well, we have to thank the World Council of Churches. Uh, the, the Orthodox uh, churches were were there, uh, at least by the 60s, the Slavic churches had, had uh, joined as well. Uh, they, they delayed their entrance for about 12 years or so anyway. Uh, but the, the, uh, the Greek-oriented uh, uh, churches had joined uh, when the WCC formed in 1948. And of course, the Oriental Orthodox churches are invited as well. So lo and behold, they find themselves sitting uh, so to speak, virtually side by side, you know, yeah, in some yeah. cases, yes, side by side. So it's the it's a beautiful opportunity to get to know one another. Yeah. Uh, which is just so utterly crucial in, in any kind of you know reconciliation uh uh efforts. So the first uh, meeting I guess was in nineteen sixty four. There were a series leading up to uh the first agreed statement uh, 1989, and then the second one in 1990, and this is where uh, the the uh, the delegates in the uh, conference on both sides, and they are listed uh, nicely mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the end of the uh, second statement. So we see we see who they were, and uh, I think it's it's tremendously encouraging encouraging to go through. Uh, this second agreed statement and see what both sides, at least the delegates, you know, uh, on both sides are agreeing to. 
Yeah, for sure. Let, let's do that. So okay, we have here uh, the first three points, and uh, we can read them if you'd like, or you just want to refer to them. But uh, we're going to go through. There's there's ten of them, and then there is a conclusion. Uh, three brief comments in 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 conclusion. So uh, yes, I know you're very familiar with these. So what would you like to say about these first three? Well, yeah. Let's go ahead and read here. Both families agree in condemning the Eutychian heresy. That was the heresy that was addressed at Chalcedon. So, and, and that's the heresy that Dioscorus, the Archbishop of, of Alexandria, refused to condemn. So this is a tremendous step. It's basically affirming what Chalcedon did. So further, both families confess that the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, only begotten of the Father before the ages, consubstantial with him. There's the human, there's the divine nature, uh, was incarnate. There's the human nature, born from the Virgin Mary, fully consubstantial with us, right? There's the humanity. Perfect man with perfect, with, with soul, body, and mind. He was crucified, died, and buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. Of course, the Nicene Creed here, ascending to the Heavenly Father, uh, where he sits on the right hand of the Father as Lord of all creation. And uh, at Pentecost, by the coming of the Holy Spirit, manifesting the church as his body, we look forward to his second coming. Yes, according to the scriptures. Then the second one. Okay. Both families condemn the Nestorian heresy. This was the heresy that was addressed at uh, the Third Council. So full agreement there. The crypto Nestorianism of Sir, uh, Theodore of Cyprus. Um, they agree that it is not sufficient merely to say that Christ is consubstantial both with his Father and with us. There are the two natures, by nature God and nature man, again, over and over. And this is the heart of Chalcedon two natures uh, in one person. It's necessary to affirm also that the Logos, who is by nature God, became by nature man in his incarnation in the fullness of time. So uh, uh, we have statements from uh, actually this, this double consubstantiality, very interestingly mentioned there in the uh, second point, was uh, established at the formula of reunion in 433, which actually is what closed, what completed the Council of Ephesus. Uh, and there's, of course, there's many more things that could be said there. But uh, this is this is language that finished the Third Council, that both families of churches fully agree on. Here it is, simply repeated, you see, at Chalcedon. So then we have the third point. Both families agree that the hypostasis of the Logos, right, second person of the Trinity, became composite by uniting to his divine, uncreated nature with its natural will and natural energy. We, we very much want to emphasize here the language of the sixth council. He has a natural divine will and he has a natural human will. So this is the uh, Oriental Orthodox fully accepting uh, this pro proclamation of the sixth council. And uh, so that that's the heart of that uh, of that uh, third point. Okay, let's move on then to four, five, and six. Um, both families agree that the natures with their proper energies and wills, again repeating that, are united epistatically and naturally, without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. Those are the four classic uh, adverbs of uh in, in embedded in the proclamation at chalcedon so this this is again uh very encouraging this bedrock chalcedonian language is now being accepted by at least now <laughs> now is being accepted by the uh uh the oriental orthodox delegates uh in 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 this um in in these dialogues in these conferences and let's look at the next thought, the next line here, and that they are distinguished in thought alone. Okay, now this, as well as the previous uh, 
reference to uh, uh, this the, the composite or or uh, that language of, of composite uh, arrangement with the two natures. Uh, these are these two examples are uh, typical uh, non Chalcedonian language that is accepted at the fifth ecumenical council. And there are two other examples that we'll get to. Um, so I always really like to emphasize in my courses the spirit of the fifth council held in Constantinople 553, a little more than 200 years after Chalcedon. Such a great spirit of reconciliation there that, that really the four most favorite uh, phrases, let's say, of the non-Chalcedonians are accepted at the fifth council as long as they are understood in the proper way. And that's all spelled out at the fifth council. Okay, and then uh, did we do five yet? No, okay. uh, I don't think so. Both families agree he who wills and acts is always the one hypostasis of the Logos incarnate. Uh, let, let's just recall for a moment, St. Cyril did use that phrase, one nature of the Logos incarnate, but we know from everything else he said, he really meant one person, one hypostasis of the Logos incarnate. And may I, just to, to remind our, our non-Castedonian friends, um, St. Cyril did not emphasize, he did not use that phrase that they are so centered on, one nate, that confusing phrase, one nature of the Word of God incarnate. He did not use that phrase in any of his three letters written to Nestorius, which were affirmed at the Third Council. And he also did not insist on it in that formula of reunion in 433, whereby he and uh, the Antiochians reached agreement on Christology, and the Antiochians uh, fully uh, renounced uh, Nestorianism. He also did not uh, bring in that phrase at, at that point either. So, from the Orthodox point of view, it seems uh, strange that they would insist on this one phrase when Cyril, St. Cyril himself, did not uh, insist on it. And as we've seen, it how confusing it can be. Okay, let's move on to six then. Okay. Both families agree in rejecting interpretations of councils which do not fully agree with the orders of the Third Council. And there's the letter of, it's called the Formula of Reunion, uh, the letter of Cyril to John of Antioch. So this is a reaffirmation of, of the Third Council. Okay, very good. Yeah. Let's move on yeah. then. Uh, we're going to do seven, but then we're going to take a little more time with eight and nine. So go ahead and do seven. Okay, sure. Um, here we see what I was just referring to, this traditional Cyr Cyrillian terminology. Okay, this is, uh, this is how the Oriental Orthodox deem it. This is their uh, hallmark phrase, one nature of the Word of God incarnate. And there we have it in the Greek. And there we see Mia thesis, and that's why uh, they much, much prefer to be referred to as Miaphysites, uh, referring to the one nature, really meaning one hypostasis of the Word of God incarnate, because they acknowledge the double consubstantiality of the Logos, which Eutyches denied. So here again, we're seeing the affirmation of the Fifth Council that allowed that terminology, as long as uh, nature in that phrase, Miaphysis, actually means one hypostasis. And here we have the Oriental Orthodox agreeing that the, that the Orthodox are justified in their use of the two natures formula, uh, one hypostasis in two natures, since they acknowledge that the, the distinct, uh, sorry, since they acknowledge that the distinction is in thought alone, and uh, this this is really emphasizing the, the tremendous ineffable uh, uh, connectedness, right, of the of the two natures. Uh, they're not confused, as Chalcedon says. They're not. There's no intermingling, <laughs> but they're so tremendously connected that uh, 
this, this is guarding against considering his human nature in any way separate, you see, from his divine hypostasis. Okay. And that's really the heart of the error of Nestorianism, that they consider the humanity separate from his divine hypostasis. And that's why they, they can't say one of the Trinity suffered in his humanity. Okay. They, they, they make that separation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, so far, so good. Uh, one okay, seven. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I know you have uh, some concerns about eight. So, let's put it up here for both of us to see and uh, maybe read that, but then also share your concerns. Okay, yes. Here's number eight. Both families, except the first three ecumenical councils, full scale, <laughs> which form our common, uh, our common heritage. In relation, in relation to the later four councils of the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox state, that for them, the above points one to seven are indeed the teachings, uh, are the teachings also of the four later councils totally in line with the first three. Yes, while the Orthodox, while the Oriental Orthodox consider this statement of the Orthodox as their interpretation a little bit kind of fuzzy there. Um, with this understanding, the Oriental Orthodox respond to it positively. Uh, I, I really think the Orthodox would, would want to see a stronger endorsement by the Oriental Orthodox of at least the doctrinal statements of the later four councils. They, they're doing it in the dialogue we've just read points two, three, four, all the way through seven, where they are they re are affirming these doctrinal points of the later four councils, essentially, uh, not, not and, up to the seventh council, but we're getting to that right here. Yeah, well, and related to that, yeah. uh, Dr. Ford, uh, in yeah. one of my interviews with a Coptic scholar, uh, he said that, well, uh, the later councils uh, really were not our fight. I mean, we never had a problem with icons. We never, uh, you know, the issues that you're trying to resolve were in certain locales uh, and yeah. not a universal. Is that fair? It's an interesting point. And um, as, the, uh, as the conversations continue, uh, it will be interesting to what extent the Orthodox delegates will want to have the Oriental Orthodox delegates uh, affirm uh, the uh, the teachings of the of the later four councils, we have to be in agreement that they are solid. Uh, the Oriental Orthodox have to fully agree with all everything those councils are saying. But you know, maybe I, I, I've got him still wrestling with this myself. Would we expect them to uh, be? Be celebrating the later four councils in their in their liturgical services. Would we be expecting them to be uh, celebrating the saints who were especially involved in those councils to the extent of uh, championing their work in the councils? Um, there, there may be some you know little uh, room room for uh, uh, some wiggle room. I guess we could say. Yeah, but I mean, it sounds yeah. like uh, they don't have doctrinal theological issues uh, with right. with those, but they just right. don't see them as universally applied or, or needed. Maybe is a better word. Well, I uh, maybe not. We would want them to 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 affirm that, that at least it was it was certainly per they were certainly perceived to be very very needed when they occurred, the, yeah. those later yeah. four yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, what about number nine, then? Let me find that and get it up on the screen. It's a little shorter, but uh, go ahead and deal with that one. Okay. In light of our agreed statement on Christology, as well as of the above common affirmations, yes, we have now clearly understood that both families have always loyally maintained the same authentic Orthodox Christological faith and the unbroken continuity of the apostolic tradition, though they have used Christological terms 
in different ways. John, um, we can rejoice that we have such agreement now, but to then claim that there always was the same Christological faith, I, I think it, um, uh, it, it I, uh, really, I, I think it's kind of slanderous on the, <laughs> all those involved in those many, many years of efforts at reconciliation, didn't they understand? Why was it then that they couldn't see, being 1,500 years closer, you know, uh, to the scene, so to speak, why was it that they couldn't see hmm. that we are really saying, meaning the same thing, just using uh, different vocabulary? So I, 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 I just hesitate. Uh, the Orthodox, of course, we fully understand. It's always been the same faith that that uh, these uh, that we have always been proclaiming. Um, we would we would have we would have a huge question about the uh, as we were talking about the establishment of the alternate hierarchy in Syria that's now known as the Jacobite Church mm -hmm. uh, because of those efforts by Jacob Haradai, right? Secretly ordaining establishing the. Uh, ordaining priests, non calcedonian and establishing that alternate hierarchy. I think it's a very real question that we have. Why was that effort made if we really were holding the same faith? See what I mean? I do. And so uh, I, what I'm hearing you say that the preference uh, for you would be, yes, declare what you accept and believe now. Uh, yes. Don't try to uh, uh, have us believe that you've always accepted that. I think so. That yes, absolutely, yeah, really. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, now let's go on to uh, number 10 here. Uh, did I leave room for it? Yeah. It's, it's there, yeah. All right. Uh, go ahead and deal with that, and then we'll, there's very brief, uh, therefore, <laughs> this is what we are asserting, but go ahead and do this one. Okay. Both families, number 10, both families agree that all the anathemas and condemnations of the past, which now divide us, should be lifted by the churches on both sides in order that the last obstacle, obstacle to full unity and communion of our two families can be removed by the grace and power of God. Both families agree that the lifting of anathemas and condemnations will be consummated on the basis of that the councils and fathers previously anathematized or condemned are not heretical. Uh, this is indeed, I believe, uh, these uh, anathemas, these condemnations, they are the last obstacle. Uh, it's very delicate. Uh, from the point of view of the Orthodox, the fact that Dioscorus did not <laughs> condemn Eutyches, I mean, that's a huge thing. How can we... Uh, uh, it, and it, so it's no wonder later that he is condemned uh, along with Eutyches. However, I oh, and but that yes to to emphasize at this point that did, that condemnation in an ecumenical council of Dioscorus and then also Severus, who in the next century is the leading uh, non-Chalcedonian um, theologian. Those anathemas are not proclaimed at the Fifth Council. I think it's hugely important. The Fifth Council in 553, so much uh, involved in the reconciliation effort. It's the only reason it's called. It's the only one of the seven councils that's not called to face a new heresy, uh, or at least a relatively new heresy. <laughs> it's called to win back uh, these... Uh, non-Chalcedonians to convince them that Chalcedon is indeed fully in line with the first three councils. Yes, so um, I think it's very significant. By the time we reach the sixth council, we've already said the Arab uh, conquests have made further dialogue impossible, and now the effort, the task at hand at the sixth council was to excise, to identify and remove that heresy of monothelitism, which was difficult, first of all, to discern. Uh, and then actually at the Sixth Council, there were 
quite a few sessions uh, really probing into uh, uh, the, the, the deep theology here. It was not evident at first that uh, by any means that it was a heresy, but thankfully it is seen to be a heresy uh, at the Sixth Council. And you, so you see there's a different mood there. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not <laughs> reconciling with the, uh, with the non-Chalcedonians. It's to eliminate a heresy yeah. that has been the law of the land for 40 years. You see a different, uh, a different task, a different spirit, and and I think it's that it's in the midst of that different, more strenuous, let's say, stricter spirit, so to speak, that we do have those uh, anathemas of Dioscorus and and Severus finally uh, articulated at a at an ecumenical council. To your knowledge, are there any yeah. lesser known? Uh, uh, anathemas that have since been lifted related to Chalcedon? Well, I think of what happened after Justinian. Uh, there was a conference under his nephew, Justin II, in the 560s, and um, there was uh, ongoing efforts, even after the Fifth Council is not accepted by the non Chalcedonians, just just in the next decade, further efforts. Let's keep talking. And uh, the uh, it was suggested there uh, by Emperor Justin, Justin II that any previous anathemas could be lifted and should be in light of, uh, well, he was saying, if, if we really do get convinced that we're only using different words to say the same things. So at least at least that's uh, okay. uh, an early indication that you know people were thinking in this way All that right. we we just shouldn't let somehow these anathemas be the final obstacle to re to reconciliation if we are convinced we are holding the same faith and I think the fifth council really shows we're holding the same faith we're even allowing four instances of favorite uh non calcedonian language mm -hmm. and there it is you know quoted in the in the uh second agreed statement uh in 1990. okay so this is how it concludes we therefore recommend to our churches the following practical steps uh, go over those with us briefly yes a the orthodox should lift all anathemas and condemnations against all oriental orthodox councils and fathers uh Vice versa, in uh, B, the Oriental Orthodox, lift their anathemas and condemnations of, of the uh, Byzantine, of the Greek, uh, of the Orthodox churches. Now, point C, the manner in which the anathemas are to be lifted should be decided by the churches individually. And so I, I think we do see here uh, 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 a helpful kind of leeway uh, being offered here, being understood, really how de how delicate this will be. It, I, I like that uh, that allowance, really, of, of both churches to uh, handle this in their own way. Where these anathemas occur liturgically, that will have to be dealt with. Uh, the the understanding of maybe local uh, veneration, we do have that understanding in in orthodoxy. Maybe that can come in a bit. Um, but, um, again, I would, I would just say it's, I think it's going to be far more helpful if we concentrate on what we agree on and not harken back to the past and, and try to affirm, uh, that, uh, that both sides had always held the same faith. Again, okay. I just, I see that as, as problematic. <laughs> So let me just ask you straight out, how optimistic are you that full communion with our Oriental family can be restored between the Eastern Oriental churches in the relatively near future? Well, John, I, you know, at St. Tikhon's, we have had Malankar Indian students for quite some time. Uh, they are in the uh, fifth of the five Oriental Orthodox churches, the Malankar, the Indian Orthodox Church. 
their history is so different from the history of the other four, the uh, Syrian, Ethiopian, Egyptian, and Armenian. They only came in to uh, this uh, rejection of Chalcedon only in the year 1665. Hmm. Yes, and uh, the basic understanding there is Portuguese missionaries, Roman Catholic missionaries, uh, you know the Portuguese, we recall the colony of Goa, the Portuguese colony hmm. on the western shore uh, of India. They were pressuring the, the Thomas Christians, they are hearkening back to St. Thomas, uh, to come under Rome, to accept Roman authority, and that their liturgy, which at that point was East Syrian, uh, would be Latinized. And uh, it, it threw the uh, Thomas Christians into turmoil. Some were more amenable to going in that direction than others. Uh, there was fierce resentment of that uh, uh, turmoil that was brought in by the Roman Catholic missionaries. And so finally, uh, as, as my Malachar students say, we begged for help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turns out in 1665 that the Syriac non-Casadonian Archbishop of Jerusalem mm -hmm. traveled to India and brought the, uh, the Indian Christians who were rejecting Rome, uh, bringing them under his wing and by extension under the authority Okay. of uh, the uh, the church in Syria. And that's when their liturgical uh, rites shifted from East Syria to West Syria. So I, I always love to emphasize with, with these beloved students, and by the way, every one of them has been just so uh, sweet, <laughs> so uh, cooperative. Oh my goodness, the, their, their, their Christianity shines forth. So that's another reason for optimism. You know, how many how many seminarians oh, uh, are there at St. Tikhon's that come from uh, the non-Chalcedonian Oriental background? Yeah, we've had two, three, or four every year. Every year for wow. for about uh, fifteen or so years. Yeah. yeah, so we're really getting to know them, and uh, actually talking with uh, two of them yesterday, they said the real avenue of progress is going to be they think in North America. Oh. with their students attending not only St. Tikhon's, but St. Vladimir's. Yes. And of course, that in, itso in itself, you know, that their hierarchs <laughs> would send their seminarians to uh, Chalcedonian schools, it, it just makes it so obvious. Yeah. They, uh, they're on board with, with Chalcedon. Yeah, so that's very, and actually, John, the Indian church is in dialogue with the Patriarchate of Moscow. Okay. The Catholic, the Catholic coast of the Indian Church, the head of that church, has visited Moscow, hmm. and uh, they they're having uh, annual uh, conferences. So I think that is really uh, the the avenue of most hope. So I'm very optimistic about that. Well, good, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by your prayers, by everyone's prayers. Yeah. Yes. All right, Dr. Ford, uh, is there anything else that you would like to speak to before we let you go? This has been incredibly helpful. Uh, I just think of our students, uh, the Malankars, so, so, uh, um, so godly. I have uh, participated in some of the service, the prayer services that they've, that they've had at, uh, in the chapel at St. Tikhon's. The ethos, John that I've experienced, and, and so, so many people say it, uh, Chalcedonian Christians visiting non-Chalcedonian churches, the ethos is the same. Yeah, Just, I've heard this. And, and so we marvel at that, I think. 1,500 years of separation, and the ethos is the same? This is incredible. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. So often, usually, you know, in church history, when there's a schism, the group that breaks off in time gets more and more uh, in error, and most often there's more and more splintering. Yeah. So we, we see the reverse here. Instead yeah. of those 20 different groups, now there's just five, so to speak, right? And with the ethos remaining, 
uh, virtually the same. Of course, there's always room for uh, local customs, small tea traditions, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we talk uh, about that here in North America among the Eastern uh, Orthodox sure. with our Russian yeah, and oh, Greek so. and Antiochian, yeah. etc. Yes. So that all, I think, yeah. is, is grounds for great optimism. Well, you've given us hope, Dr. Ford. Oh. I appreciate that. But you've also okay. couched that with reality. And, uh, you I know, that's so. kind of what we're trying to do here. Let's create within ourselves a deep hunger for unity. Yes. Uh, yes. with, without compromise, you know, with, without saying, well, we can give that doctrine up. Uh, no. Let's be no. very protective, but at the same yes. time, listen more and uh, maybe argue less. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Absolutely right. Well, yes. That's Dr. David Ford. He is professor of church history, and we certainly benefited from that today at St. Tegon's Orthodox Theological Seminary. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs>